This is the News Load. Hi, I'm Carrie Ann Stevenson. Welcome to News Load. We're here today with John Wade. Hello, John. How are you today? Hi, Carrie Ann. I'm great. Good, good. You look wonderful. You do not look like a typical dog trainer, though. Well, this is how I dress for my appointments. That's wonderful. So please tell me your technique. Um, well, the approach that you will traditionally see is sort of might be a little easier to kind of go over the way we uh, normally perceive dog training and people going to group classes and that sort of thing. And I've always felt that um, as you get a, 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 with the dog and it being as personalized as possible, whereas a group class, you kind of kind of feel like you're trying to teach a kid to do geometry, the gateway of Disneyland. There's so much stuff going on. and. Uh, and you generally have to uh, elevate your approach in order to try and get the dog's attention. And there's kind of two schools of thought on how you do that. And I, I personally don't think either of them are correct. Uh, one is the uh, idea of being all positive all the time, ignore bad behavior, uh, like redirect with treats and that sort of thing. In, in fact, almost everybody who has a puppy carry on uh, will run into problems with the puppy mouthing, nipping, and biting at them. The puppies are supposed to do that for a reason from an evolutionary perspective. And we're supposed to respond in a certain way. But dog trainers typically will tell you, Carrie Ann, redirect with a toy. Or they'll say a timeout or uh, stand up, turn your back, and, and uh, feign pain, although it's not always feigning pain. Um, just think of it in, in slightly different terms. If I bit you, Carrie Ann, um, and you gave me a new fly fishing rod, I don't know that you definitely just, that you necessarily discourage the behavior. Um, timeouts in nature um, don't exist because they would result in tragedy. Um, uh, feigning you're being hurt and is more of I surrender. And the purpose of a puppy interacting with its litter mates and its mother in that manner is to elicit a response that helps them as they mature Who's the teacher and who's the student? So mother dogs are as loaded as uh, uh, with oxytocin, uh, and they're very loving. And but when puppies are about three weeks of age, they have those little razor blades in their mouth, and when they're nursing, uh, it hurts. So mother dog, well, that's when she'll introduce what I call an ugly mom, that other side of our mothers who say, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. And so puppies end up learning uh, that she's the teacher, they're the student, and to read and take note of her tone and body language to see whether they're being encouraged or discouraged. But in the dog training world, it's almost impossible to get a dog trainer to show you how to say no in a way that the, a dog understands it's not bad, you're not bad, but you're not kidding around. This has to stop. So uh, the uh, what a lot of people end up running into is an approach what they call like dominance type thing. You got to be alpha, dominant, that kind of thing. You probably heard of that. And that, again, does not draw on the uh, on real behavior. In real behavior, uh, like dominance in the, the behavioral world, uh, if you're looking at the animal kingdom, would be like this time of year, a male deer are fighting for dominance so that they can pass their genes on. So it's in a legitimate form of establishing hierarchy, but it has nothing to do with parenting. Uh, it would be kind of like, Karen, Ann, you and I go to a bar and we don't behave. We meet the bouncer and the bouncer cle cleans our clock a little bit, but we don't go, you know, that'd be a great way to raise a kid. So long story short, the two ways that we normally encounter how to train a dog, sort of the treat uh, approach or the dominance approach, neither of those are natural and they don't draw on the areas of behavior where there's all kinds of research to support it, uh, like evolutionary psychology and biology and ethology. There's all kinds of things. So most dog trainers will stick to the all positive ones, more to B.F. Skinner's work back in the 60s, which I use for teaching tricks, but not for teaching life skills. There's like two separate areas. So I noticed years ago that the, these dogs were being trained with food and people were winning their obedience competition. And so they would go, this is the way people should train their dog. But Carrie Ann, when they leave the obedience ring, you cut their leash, I'll take their treats and see how long it takes them to get their dog to the car. 
It, it's a routine they learn, which is kind of like a play. It's fine for that, and I've used it for movies and TV shows, but I try and work with people one-on-one -on -one in their home and uh, with everybody that normally interacts with the dog on a day-to-day -day basis and show them, this is how your dog sees the world. Here's how it makes connections as to who's the teacher and who's the student. And, uh, you know, I think it's a lot more about the little little things. Uh, like we've all had moms that spend their day doing things like saying, Carrie Ann, did you brush your teeth? Come here, let me smell them, go do them again. And later, did you do your homework? And later, it's here and there through the day. And we actually, at a young age, start to learn body language and tone. And then our, our moms and our dads start to use tone and body language. So um, something I always find semi-humorous is a, a lot of the dog trainers who insist they're force-free. Force-free is a big catchphrase. Um, they they don't acknowledge that from birth to young adulthood in our in our world um is the first one third is the most physically exhausting for moms and dads because we we're not yet on the same page with the tone of the body language and got the foundation skills down and so uh force is the wrong word abuse is the wrong you you wouldn't do that but you can't change a diaper without using some element of force it, it, it's but you're always using your tone and your body language so i help people i have people get to the point where they can use their voice uh to to help a dog understand whether they're warm or cold and just little things during the day that are the doggy equivalent of who's the teacher who's the student did you brush your teeth did you comb your hair it'd be ask a little thing when we go out the door ask a little thing if we walk in the kitchen ask a little thing every time we go to the stairs so if i got a puppy and it was, you know, not potty trained yet. What is a simple solution to get it to go outside? Well, I'll play a little devil's advocate and I'll be a bit of a curmudgeon here. Uh, the first thing you should know is you got your dog from somebody who's not a real breeder. Uh, I call them kind of greeters. They breed dogs. They know the difference between a male and female dog. But by the time you pick up a puppy, Carrie Ann, it should be well on its way to being house trained and crate trained. Two very important things to a novice dog owner. So, um, but I, I have a little program that I use with puppies. And the goal is that by the time they're 16 weeks, that's if you get them at about seven and a half, eight weeks of age, they should be going to the bathroom three times a day in one spot. So there's not landmines all over the yard for kids to deal with and lawnmowers to, to, uh, to do. And it's basically not that different from toilet training a kid. I have a little schedule I give my clients and I say, okay, this puppy's digestive system is not fully coordinated yet. Uh, it, it, it doesn't recognize the body signals. So we preemptively, let's say we'll take the puppy out once an hour. Uh, a lot of the, what I, I, I call it kind of the amateur dog training world carry in. Uh, and uh, it's not a criticism of the people. It's just the approach I think is, is rather, uh, isn't well thought through. They want to teach the dog to ring a bell or, you know, give a sign it needs to go to the bathroom. But that is the dog training you, not the other way around. And it fails miserably, even if it works, because the dog starts ringing the bell for everything. So I want a dog to go, you know, within half an hour of me waking up, I got the coffee on and, you know, changed my clothes and say, okay, buddy, that's how we go. Half an hour after I come home from appointments and half an hour to go to bed. But in the beginning, I set my watch for, uh, let's say an hour and dang, time to go. And the puppy goes, I don't need to go. And I go, well, it sucks to be you because you're going out anyway. And I take it to the one spot. And if it goes great, if it doesn't, that's okay. We bring it in, we, we, we supervise, and then we go it every hour. If, when we get three days in a row where there's no accidents, then it's time to stretch it a little bit. And on average, by the time the puppy's 16 weeks, they're good. They can generally sleep through the night by 10 weeks. So usually I want people to set their alarm and wake the puppy up rather than have the puppy vocalize and get a reaction out of us, which could backfire uh, uh, down the road as well. Another thing, two, th two other things we do with pups is, is we often cordon off places of the, the home and say, well, we're not going to let the puppy in these areas until the puppy's house trained. That's not a bad idea, but you should have the puppy on a leash in those areas uh, for you know, long enough to check your messages on your phone because when you when the puppy's house trained and the
percent of them go, oh, it's just a closer bathroom, um, as opposed to seeing it as living area. But if you get them in there a little bit while they're growing up, they'll they generally will also avoid going in those areas and just continue uh, uh, to go outside. And uh, uh, the uh, the other thing is, by the time they're ten weeks, they should be able to sleep through through the through the night. Cool. So you say you've worked on movies and television. What's your favorite movie that you worked on? Yeah, uh, the movies that I worked on, I can't even remember the titles because it was so long ago. But they were like uh, 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 like film students from uh, uh, from film school. Uh, but the the TV show that I worked on that it's on it's you know, like it was a long time ago, Carrie Ann, but uh, it, it just got released on Netflix. Uh, it was called Due South. And uh, the, the, the dog in that was uh, supposed to be a wolf, but it was a Siberian Husky. And uh, um, so I, I did the prep work for that series and I handled the dog uh, for, for an episode. And then my first son was born. And so I left Hollywood behind. But did you meet Paul Gross, the Mountie? Oh, yes. Is he nice? Um, we didn't have a lot. That, like, I, like there are scenes where you see the car racing down the road. And uh, you'll see Diefenbaker in, in the car. I'm in the car behind them, um, in, uh, down below, handling the dog. So my job was to focus on the dog and not distract people like Paul because they've got a, they've got their own job to do. <laughs> very, very cool. What did you make the dog do? Like run down the street after the car, kind of thing? Well, yeah, that's interesting. Like a lot of people don't know that there was far more than one dog. The original dog that they picked for that sh uh, for that show was I, I would never have picked him. I, I he didn't have what I what I call kind of like a a stable temperament. There's certain things that uh, a dog needs to go through between three and twelve weeks of age to to have them be very laissez faire about their 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 surroundings. So we had like a few I'll call them stunt dogs. Uh, like we even had a, like a white shepherd on the show that. Uh, because they, they occasionally wanted uh, uh, Dave Bigger to show his teeth. And uh, that's a lot easier to teach a shepherd to do on command than it is a husky. So uh, 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 there was also a, a husky Malamute that was, uh, he, he was unbelievable in his desire to be near me. And so we could put him on, this, on one side of a chain link fence that was 12 feet high. And if I was on the other side, he would climb it. He would climb all the way up. So he was great. Uh, there was one uh, scene where um, there was a series of backyards and with, with fences separating all the houses. And uh, basically, somebody was hanging on to him for dear life. And then I was uh, four or five yards away. And this is, he, you just see him leap fence, leap fence, leap fence. So we kind of use natural instincts to teach like things that are more tricks. But uh, again, the, in the scenes where we are... Uh, like the, what, with traffic and stuff around, the approach was much as I was saying earlier. We're teaching life skills uh, where we don't want it to be for the treat. Treat the, we want it to be out of respect and that kind of understanding that um, some things you have to do whether you want to do them or not. And in the long run, it's for our own good. But in the dog training world, it, it's it's very Disney esque in, in in the way that they are they approach it. And I think a lot of dogs lose opportunities. I mean, most of us, if we have a dog carry in, we're not looking for Lassie, but you know, if we go camping or fishing or, or hiking, we want to take our dog. And in order to do that, they have to do better than they learn in these obedience classes. People want to be able to come home from a walk and have their arms the same length. They don't look looking for anything particularly fancy. Uh, when they would tell a dog to stay, that means don't move until I tell you to come, not just as long as I've got a treat in in my uh, hand. And, uh, you know, recall means I want to see grass stains on the pads of your feet. We need you to get back here. Um, that gives a dog tons of freedom, but it's very rare to see anybody go to uh, like these typical classes and get anywhere near that level of, of response. Do you have a favorite breed of dog? You know, I hate to say because I like all breeds, but um, it, I, if, if I was cornered, I'd have to say German Shepherds I have a fondness for. As the Germans, yes, yes, we are a good, we are a good breed of people, and and they're they're excellently trained. They're brilliant. 
They've changed a, 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 a bit though over the years, uh, Carrie Ann. Uh, like when you say they're brilliant, I always tell clients, um, I have no doubt how smart your dog is, but an IQ of 140 will put your kids in jail just as easy as university. And years ago, when I started my career, the, I would run into German shepherds once in a while that were more than a handful and probably not appropriate for the people. And I would be able to steer them onto like a police department because they, they had the type of drive, but it was difficult to find that caliber of German Shepherd in North America. And then the, the Iron Curtain went down and uh, we were able to import dogs from places like Czechoslovakia who did nothing but breed um, working lines and the, uh, very high drive dogs. And the German Shepherd has made a comeback in recent years. And those genetics, like it's, it's not the sit with you by the fire companion dog. This is a check the windows, check the doors sort of dog. And so they were, they're a little more like a Ferrari than a minivan. And so uh, I'm getting, I'm getting, I have a lot of appointments with, with German shepherds recently. And they're just, they set the bar a little higher uh, as to who they're going to listen to. But you know, they're, they're just poetry in action when you've got a good relate. Like, I don't want my German Shepherd to look at my fingers. I want them to look at me. I want them to uh, be trying. It's the only species on the planet, I think, out there, Carrie Ann, that was bred to love us. You don't have to bribe them to get them to do things. You just have to learn how they work. My favorite thing is when I'm walking down the street and the dog is looking up at the owner, you know, happy, tail wagging you know, for yeah. the approval and for the love. Like I'm doing good dad, right? Just beautiful. Yeah, yeah it is. It cer certainly is. It's, it's I, I, what, you know, when I, I was a little hesitant to just say German Shepherd because any breed of dog, like, it, it, like it, I don't care whether it's a Beagle or Jack Russell, or Joe, when you get to see them do the things they were originally bred for, it's just magical letting them fulfill that. And so we've got so many dogs out there with a herding drive or retrieve drive or that, that don't get to do those things. Like uh, they go on a walk and uh, their favorite thing. I, I teach a lot of dogs now just how to use their nose to find their dinner. And I turned it into this big rigmarole. Dogs want to use their nose. And, you know, we, we, we go to these classes where, you know, everybody's staring at their dog like they're trying to bend a spoon with the power of their mind and they're doing geometric patterns around pylons. Uh, you got to fulfill a dog's needs as well to have a balanced dog. Yeah, let the let the dash hun dig, let the let the hound dog sniff, you know, like all of it. I went this summer uh, to a seminar on blood trailing, and um, the uh, so there was a, there were all kinds of dogs there, but there's a, was a dog imported from Germany that was a dachshund. They call it something else, and I can never remember the name of it. But they're they these dogs are bred to. Um, to, to follow blood trails like for injured animals and uh it, it was it was just it was a little bit hilarious and it was a lot of fun watching the dachshund work uh they're so different than the other dogs but it always got its it, it always made it to the destination so i i do again it doesn't matter what breed i love watching them work Wonderful. Well, John, I really want to thank you for your time today. Um, two things. Uh, where can we find you if we want to hire you to help train our dog? Uh, my, I have a website, uh, www.askthedogguy.com. I think it's in the background screen of my uh, my background here. Uh, and so that that's a general website. It's got hundreds and hundreds of articles, but uh, there's a, a section there on uh, the different training programs that I that, that I offer. Or they can just email me, john at askthedogguy.com and uh, tell me what they're trying to accomplish and I can send them the program information. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And one last thing, if you don't mind, if you can say it loud, say it proud, I love news load. I love news load. Thank you, John, I hope you have an amazing day. All right, bye-bye, Karen. Bye-bye. This is the News Load.